This is a series where we're, it's a kind of a change of pace. We're doing a character study of John the Baptist. Um, you're going to learn a lot about him over the next four weeks, kind of the themes of his life and how they uh, can apply to our life. Very powerful man to study. Um, if you guys don't know a little bit about him, you're going to learn a lot about him, but let me kind of give a little bit intro today in part one. Um, John the Baptist um, was, the Bible says he like lived in the desert. He ate um, locusts and wild honey, meaning like there was no one, no one went and visited him. He gave him a sandwich or something. They just left him out there. He was like just uh, kind of outcast kind of. The Bible says that he, he wore camel's hair, like he sewed camel's hair together and made himself a little outfit, meaning he probably found a dead camel somewhere and made his, his suit. So it sounds like a guy you want to invite over for dinner. Anybody? No? John the Baptist, seriously, John the Baptist was like that under, I don't know, that socially awkward second cousin or something like that, that comes over your house on holidays or special events and like embarrasses you. You're like, yeah, that's John. You don't see him much, you know, or so, he's, seriously, he's that dude. So he lived in the desert. He didn't have a home. He didn't have any, any like uh, belongings, really possessions. Like he was just, you know, out there in the desert, no change of clothes, all that stuff. But behind it all, there was a purpose. There was a method to John's madness. There was. There was, there was a purpose to it all. He had one purpose, and that was to prepare the way of the coming Christ. All of it, all of what he did was all for this one central mission of his life, to prepare the way of the coming Christ. And I can think of, honestly, no better person to study as we get ready for Easter Sunday. Four weeks from now, the next four weeks, we're going to be studying this character really to help prepare us for the greatest harvest that we see in our nation and at discovery of people coming to the Lord. This is, the, this is a guy who, who was making so many waves in, in, in his time that the religious leaders had, they had to take notice. There were so many people, so many follow. He was like getting a following and his messages. They were going out to the desert to hear this, this guy. He was a little weird. He was an outcast, but they're like, he was getting a following. So the religious leaders were a little bit afraid of his message. Like, what is he saying? Is he taking power and people away from us? And so they went out there to hear one of his messages and, and to ask him a question. They asked him what may be a weird question to us, but they said, hey, are, are, are you really Elijah? Are you saying you're Elijah? There was just a lot of confusion about who John the Baptist was. And so he responded. He, he said, I'm, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice in the wilderness crying. You don't need to know my name. I'm nobody. I'm just, that's all I am is, is a voice. In fact, when Later on, when Jesus uh, you know, came on the scene, was going to begin his earthly ministry, his disciples said to John, is that who? He said, and he said, this is the guy, you guys just said, ah, he must increase and I must decrease. This, this man had so much authority, yet so much humility, which is, which is why the series is called Faceless. Because it, it's, he stands in stark contrast to our culture, to our society that's you know, trying to, people trying to make a name for themselves, trying to make a way for themselves. And, and, and John comes on the scene. He's like, I'm not trying to make a way for me. I'm, try, I'm trying to prepare the way for him who's coming after me. I don't need, you don't need to know my name. You don't need to know my face. I'm nobody. I'm just a voice. I have an assignment from God. So for the next four weeks, we're going to study these major themes that show up in very, just, just a few amount of Verses, really, that John, that John has in the Bible. And we're going to study these themes and these scriptures, and we're really going to apply them to our life and see what, we, what God would say to us and what we can learn from this, from this man, from John the Baptist. Today's theme, if you will, the title of the theme, is destiny. Destiny is our, is our theme today. And before we jump into the actual scriptures that's in your handout, Luke chapter 1, let me give you a very important backstory. Luke is the very first, one of the first gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all the, the, the gospels, the four gospels of the New Testament. It's Jesus' earthly ministry, but it actually begins with John that we're going to see. Before, before this time, though, before the gospels, there is 400 years of what theologians call the time of silence. There was 400 years where God's voice is not heard 
among the people. There is no prophetic voice. There is no vision set before the people. It's a, it's a time of silence, 400 years. And because of that, because of 400 years without the voice and the vision of God set before the people, the Bible says, where there is no vision, men cast off restraint. And that's what happened. There was a lot of wandering going on in this time. People were falling away. And, and, and honestly, where there's no vision and voice of God, religion and hypocrisy runs rampant. And that's what happened to the, even the, the leaders of the church, the leaders of that time, the religious leaders, it was just hypocrisy and legalism was rampant because of this, this time of just no voice and no vision before the people. And this is where the scene that John is stepping into. And so to, to even set up the scriptures, we're going to jump into Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 13. You're going to see Zechariah already in the temple. Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. He was a priest, and he was given the honor um, to, to be the priest at this time, to go into the temple, into the holiest place, to make intercession for God's people. It's a great honor, but in there, in that holy place, he actually sees an angel. He gets this visitation, so now the silence breaks, and God sets before his people vision and voice once again. Let's pick it up. The angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. So they've been praying for a long time for, the, for a baby. An angel comes on the scene and says, hey, it's going to happen. Here's the vision. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you're to call him. He even gave him the name. John is the name. This is what the name you're going you're gonna to call him. He will be a joy and a delight to you. That's good to know. Good to know that he's not going to be a burden, okay? Thank you for that. Uh, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For this is what he's going to do. He's going to be great in the sight of the Lord he is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. So this is before the Holy Spirit's been poured out. So theologically, the Holy Spirit had not been poured out upon God's people yet because Jesus had, did not yet go to the cross, pay for sins, be resur and, and be resurrected. Now the Holy Spirit is available to every person to be, to be indwelled and have the fullness of the Spirit. So John is like a model for us, which is another great reason why to study it, because he models for us what it looks like to, be, to, to have the Holy Spirit, to be filled. Honestly, what we have an inheritance of the Holy Spirit, of something he just modeled. It's our inheritance now, the Holy Spirit, to be full of the Holy Spirit. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And so a lot of people that were wandering at that time, they ran away. From, it was just a time of silence. That's what happened. People, and he said, he's going to bring them back. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And now it's even, not only is he given his name, but he's given him the assignment, the mission. Here's, now here's his name. Your prayers are answered. Here's the name. Here's his identity. Here's his calling. This is the mission I'm giving him. To turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord and then after all that, I want you to picture this with me, right? I mean, just in the temple of God, a holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the, all, an angel before him. Your prayers are answered. You've been praying. You've been asking. Here it is. Zechariah asked the angel, can I be, how can I be sure of this? Like, a, I need, so he's asking for a sign now. The angel wasn't enough in the temple that, you know, of, of a sign, which it just underscores the, really the, the hopelessness, the discouragement of the, of the time. It really was. Not only is it a time of silence in this what's called the intertestamental period, just that time of silence between the prophets and when John and Jesus step on the scene, and that hopelessness that comes from not hearing the voice and the vision of God, but they themselves were praying and were in need and didn't see God. So it just kind of underscores the discouragement and the despair that Zechariah could not even see the miracle that was before him, that was declaring to him. He's asking for more than an angel, more than this, this visitation from the angel. Can I get, how can I be sure of this? I need a sign because I'm an old man and my wife is already well along in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I'm a pretty big deal. You know what I'm saying? I think it's funny so the way I read the Bible. You guys see that? I mean, he's all questioning. I'm like, I need a sign. He's like, do you even read your Bible, bro? My name is Gabriel. I mean, I'm in there. I'm in there. Do you read? Daniel, hello? I'm there. 
okay? I, I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now, because, you know, now you'll be silent and not able to speak until this day happens. So he questioned it. He asked for more, and so he, he, he made him silent. Because you did not believe my words, which, check this out, they're going to come true anyway. Whether you believe it or not, there is an appointed time, and it's going to happen. I need to shut you up because you're going to mess it up. But I'm, so, which was really a blessing in disguise, really, to put that, put a, put, to make him, what the Bible says, some translations is dumb, right? Really what it means is just made him, he wasn't able to, wasn't able to speak. He's like, you're going to, no, this, there is an appointed time. And I love that it used that phrase even because we're just coming out of this series called Seasons, right? And, and um, I love teaching in series, you guys. And I want you to know, for those of you that call Discovery Home, we don't just like haphazardly preach topics and preach, pick topics out. There is so much intentionality in prayer and fasting and focus and, and listening in and tuning in to the voice of God and what he is declaring to his people in this season and this time. That, that along, You guys, we're not just picking topics. We're on a journey. Okay, and so there, the Bible is saying that there is an, an appointed time. It may look like that God is, has been silent, that you haven't heard from him. It may look like, yeah, 400 years of nothing, but God was behind the scenes preparing the exact scenario, the right situation for not only John to come on the scene and herald and be a forerunner, but for the Messiah to come in the right situation and pay the eternal price for sin once and for all. So it's an appointed time time, appointed time. And the, the, the Bible says that, that John will come in the, in the power of Elijah. And I think it's, it, theolo- let me kind of, in this series, I kind of want to point out some theolog- the, theological stuff to you and give, share with some things maybe you didn't know, but also really get application and truth with you. So uh, John is, you can think of him as a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He is bridging the old covenant, God's covenant with Israel, and his new covenant to all mankind now. He is, he's a bridge, and this is, it's specific. God does nothing by accident. Very specific why the angel declared his name. I am Gabriel. It didn't happen very often, but it was very intentional because he is the iconic angel of the Old Testament. He's the one who shows up in, in, in the book of Daniel, which they know, and he and Zechariah would know. And then the, in the spirit and power of Elijah, that is the iconic prophet of the Old Testament. And, and so he is this, this bridge, if you will, coming in this power of the Holy Spirit that is just a model of what we are going to be inheriting. To, Jesus said this. This is why it's kind of important for us to study John the Baptist. Matthew 11 says this about John the Baptist. He said, this is the one about whom it was written. And then he quotes an Old Testament prophet, actually the last prophet in the Old Testament, Malachi in chapter 3, again, just kind of bridging it, bridging this, the, the, you know, talking about John the Baptist being a bridge. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone, check this out, anyone greater than John the Baptist. Here is this guy, seemingly crazy, socially awkward, a little weird, you know, doesn't kind of fit in, but boldly declared the kingdom of God and influenced people to repent, be baptized, and follow God wholeheartedly. Yeah, he didn't conform to social norms, but Je- later on in John chapter 10, Jesus would actually say that there was not, not one miraculous sign John the Baptist performed. Yet, yet he is called the greatest. There's no, no one greater than him, full of the Holy I just, look, I want to point this out to you because I think that God's definition of greatness is a lot different than our definition of greatness sometimes. And so John comes with this kind of this faceless attitude. You don't need to know me. I'm just a voice. I'm just preparing the way. He must increase and I'm going to decrease. I, and Jesus says, man. Yeah, he didn't fit in. Yeah, people, he rubbed people the wrong way. Yeah, he didn't fit into culture and norms. And, but that is what greatness looks like. That's what it looks like to be full of my spirit, of my power. And then he goes on and says, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Because he just modeled something. He's just a bridge. 
He's just, he's just a, a bridge of something greater of what I'm going to pour out from the days of John the Baptist until now. The kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have raided, been raiding, he says, against it. So the question today in, in, in the theme of today um, of destiny is, write it down this way, what is God's will for my life? Because we read this amazing stories like this and about, you know, John being, you know, uh, before he was ever born, name given, mission given, assignment given. Like, does God, like, is that just for some people? Does God have that kind of, you know, destiny and that kind of, like, specifics for everybody? Or is it just some people, kind of, he knows the detail like that? Or is there, does he have, like, a specific destiny and a specific will for my life? What is it, what does that look like for me? So I want to kind of dive into that today. And the way I want to teach is I want to tell you what, who you're not and who you are. And so that's the way I want to kind of teach it today using John and his story as a springboard because you, need, you just need to know this, man, about your destiny. You need to know who you're not. So here, write some notes. Number one, you are not an accident. Now, you need to know that today, church. You've got to receive this because both Mary and Elizabeth, they um, marry the mother of, of Jesus. They both kind of conceive their kids in in you know, unusual circumstances and probably, probably got a lot of ridicule because of that. Uh, but I want you to know something today. Your birth was no mistake or mishap. It, your life is not a fluke of nature. Your parents may not have planned it, but God did. God has a plan. You are not, your birth is not a surprise to God. In fact, he, he, he expected it. He planned it. Long before you were conceived by your parents, you were conceived in the mind of God. It wasn't fate, chance, or luck, or coincidence that you are breathing today in the city you are in, in the family you are, in the chair you are sitting. It is destiny at work. God has a plan for your life. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Like he already planned you to be a part of his family according to the purpose of his will. God decided, regardless of who your parents are, whether they're good or bad or indifferent, God knew that those two individuals possessed the exact DNA makeup to make the custom you that he had in mind. And while there are illegitimate parents, there are no illegitimate children. Amen, somebody? There are no illegitimate children. A lot of children are unplanned by their parents, but they're not unplanned by God. God even takes into account human error and even sin to work out his plan, his purpose, and his destiny for your life. And do you know what the motive of God was for creating you? Like what motivated God to create you? It was love. Love, that's it. He because he wanted to love you. Look at the verse right before Ephesians 1.5. Ephesians 1.4 says, Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love. God was thinking of you before he even made the world, before he even created the planets and the cosmos. He had you in mind. In fact, he created this earth the way he created to sustain and take care of you. That's the whole purpose. In fact, the more you know, physicists and sci- scientists study the universe and the cosmos, the more that this is seen, the more evidence that there is that is custom made by a masterful designer, that it is not an accident. I have this quote from this guy, Dr. Michael Denton. He wrote this book, Nature's Destiny, and how it kind of reveals God. He said, all the evidence available in the biological sciences supports the core proposition that the cosmos is a specially designed whole with life and mankind as its foundational goal and purpose. That's why it was designed. A whole in which all facets of reality have their meaning and explanation in this central fact. The more that scientists discover about the the universe, the more that they see this is not and cannot be an accident. It was, it takes a great, great care and precision to create the custom made individual that you are. You, you listen, you are not an accident. Okay. Here's, here's number two. You are not 
forgotten. You are not forgotten. It's easy to feel forgotten by God when you've been waiting for so long. Maybe you've, uh, there's an unanswered prayer that you've been praying for. Maybe it's a, it's a breakthrough or uh, there's a situation or circumstance. Um, for Zechariah, it was not only the 400 years of, of silence, and, and at that time, people were thinking, like, where is God? Has he looked over us? Has he forgotten us? But Zechariah specifically was praying for a son, was praying for children, had been praying for so long that it was, it was hard for him to believe the miracle that was right in front of him. Waiting is hard at any time, but when days and weeks and even months pass, years sometimes, and our prayers don't go answered, and, and it's easy to feel like God has forgotten us. It's easy to get discouraged when we're waiting for an answer, for, for a voice, or a vision, or direction from God. But Jesus would tell you that you are not forgotten. Look at Luke chapter 12. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten, not even those sparrows. God knows and has not forgotten them. Why, even the hairs on your head that are falling out every day, come on, somebody, 20, 30 of them every day, man, they're all numbered. God knows them. Fear not, you are of more value than, he says, many sparrows. It's at that time, though, that we, that, in that waiting period, that I think Satan likes to whisper in our ear, right? God has forgotten you. It's not going to change. It's not going to be different this time. No, not for you. That may be for some people. Oh, yeah, that may, and that's what Zachariah's thinking, seeing everybody else have kids, and he's just getting older. Maybe it's for some people. I see it in the Word. Yeah, you read reading the Word, but it ain't for you. That's, and he'll whisper in our ears the discouragement. We buy into this lie that we've been forgotten, but the truth is there is destiny inside of you, and God calls your destiny valuable, that you are valuable. You are not forgotten. You are not an accident. And number three, you are not hopeless. And this is the situation of the time, right? This is the time and the day that they were living in a very hopeless uh, uh, time. They, they were under Roman rule, oppressed, no vision, no voice. So people, what they did is they just moved further and further away from God. And actually, the further you, you are away from God, the more hopeless you become. And then the converse of that is true. The closer you get to God, the more hope you have. Isn't that true? Like, like uh, the, the most hopeful people in, in the world are the people who are closest to God. And, and then the, the most hopeless people in the world are the people who are furthest away from God, the more hopeless you will be. And it's interesting to see how, uh, what people put their hope in, right? They'll put their hope in people or they'll put their hope in their career or money or, or politics. And, and I'll tell you right now, uh, our hope does not rely on the person we put in the White House. Our hope relies on the person we put on the cross. That's, that's, where our hope, that's where our hope lies. And we put our hope in all these, all these wrong things. And I was thinking about this because I really think that we're living in a time where people have drifted away from God. And it's, and it's creating hopelessness in our society and in people and in, in human, mankind. And I wrote, what happens when a culture forgets God? A lot of the symptoms really that are happening when a culture forgets, forgets God. Um, wealth is idolized. Truth is minimized. Life is trivialized. It sounds like a rap, huh? <laughs> Someone dropped me a beat. No, I'm kidding. Um, abortion is legalized. Television is vulgarized. Advertising is sensualized. Everything is sexualized and commercialized. Our conscience has been desensitized. Education is secularized. Free markets are monopolized. Races are pol polarized. Sports are scandalized. Morals and ethics are liberalized. In entertainment, crime is centralized. Immorality is popularized. Drugs are legitimized. Sin is glamorized. Politics are paralyzed. The breakup of family is rationalized. Manners are uncivilized. Christians are demonized. And God is marginalized. That's what happens when a culture drifts away from God, and I think we're seeing that. We're just, we, it was happening in John's time. We're seeing it in our time. But the farther you get away from God, the more hopeless the situation in your life will feel. But you are, and the enemy is after your hope. He wants to rob you of your hope because if you don't, you'll you'll just drift. If you don't have hope, you're drifting further and further away 
from God. John 10.10 10 actually says he's a, he's, a, he's a thief. That's what he wants. He wants to take your hope. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come so that you would have this hope, that you would have life and have it abundantly. You are not hopeless. Hope is not an idea or a thought. Hope is truth. Hope is a belief that God is just that. He's God. He is God. And in the face of your mountains and your trials and your difficulties, don't lose hope. He is God. And whether you believe he's God or not doesn't, doesn't make him less God, okay? It doesn't. And that's why I love what I do. I love what I do as a pastor. I get to come up here every week and, and speak truth. And that's what I offer every week, whether people receive it or not. I, I offer truth. And the truth is, listen, the truth is you are not an accident. You are not this, this chemical makeup, this pool of, of goo. You are not an accident. You are not forgotten. You are not hopeless. You have a destiny. You have a purpose. God himself has designed you specifically and uniquely and has destiny over your life. He, know, he knows your name. So let's pick up this story of, of John the Baptist who's just modeling something very beautiful. We'll peek back on the curtain of God's design and God's mind and how intimately he knows each and every one of us. Now in Luke chapter 1, uh, picking up in verse 63, the, the baby is already here. Full term, Elizabeth got pregnant, John the Baptist, and is now um, already full of the Holy Spirit, which is amazing. Already full. Of the, there's a story. I don't have time to get into all of John, but I'm going to try in four weeks. There's a story of when uh, Mary the mom of, of Jesus, goes and visits Elizabeth, and Mary's in the womb, just a, just a couple months younger than John the Baptist. Elizabeth is a little bit further along, and just on the onset of Mary preg pregnant with Jesus coming into the space of, of John the Baptist, he's, he's already doing what? He's already leaping and kicking like, hey, hey, Elizabeth, check it out, he's here. Just, he's already proclaiming like this, he's here. This is... This is it's, it's amazing. So here he is now, um, already being born, and Zechariah still can't speak. And he says, he motions for a writing tablet. To everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John. I know, I know this. I know his name. The angel told me his name. He told me his assignment. He told me his identity. I know it. You guys need to, you guys need to hear this and get in line with the angel told me his name is John. In which everyone was surprised at that name because it wasn't a family name. In which your first, in that time, the first son would give a family name, and, and this is nowhere in his family. His name is John, and instantly Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God, and awe fell, fell upon the whole neighborhood. And the news about this child, of what happened, spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on those events and asked, what will this child turn out to be? we got to peek behind the curtain. Wow. What is... What's this? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. So I got a question for you guys um, today to kind of ponder with me. Why did the angel give us a, why did God give us a peek behind the curtain in the first place? Why did God let Zechariah in on what he was doing? Why not just do it? Why not just do the miracle, right? They would have, they would have been praying for the baby, they would all thought it was a miracle, you know, and praised God for it, thanked God for it. Zechariah would have never been mute. It just would have happened. Why, why give the announcement? Why give the details? You want to know why I think? I think, I think it's because God uses and even, you know, he, he invites our participation in his purposes. Like this. Like, yes, he has destiny in store. He has a unique and specific plan for you, but he invites your participation in, in, in fulfilling your destiny. There's two truths. When it comes to destiny, you've got to kind of realize two truths, I think, that are very important. One, we can't do anything without God. Okay, you, there is nothing that we can do without God. Okay, and, 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 and even with John, John, you can't do anything without God. You can't. Now, the flip side of that coin is also true that you need to understand about your destiny. Not only does we can't do anything about God, but God chooses to do nothing without man. That's his choice, and you need to know that about God. We read about this recently about Isaiah when, when God said, Whom will go for us and whom will I send? I got some things that I need to be told, things to be declared, miracles to be done, headways to be made. 
Who's going to go? I'm not going. God's like, I ain't going, okay? I'm not sending the angels. Hey, man, I've given you dominion over the earth. Who among you will say, here I am, send me? God chooses to do nothing without man. He invites you to participate in the purpose that you were designed for. That's why. That John, he, he, he lets these parents know not only his, his mission, but his identity, his name is John. And this is assignment. Don't you think that these parents are going to steward the greatness of this child now? Don't you think they're going to they're gonna raise him? That's why he told them, the angel told them, because they needed to steward their child like he was great. They needed to steward that child like he was full of the Holy Spirit on a holy assignment and a mission from God. You don't treat him like you would treat something common because he is mine, says the Lord. Amen, somebody? This is identity. This is who he is. You need to know it. Why? Here, write this down. Because until we define our identity, we can't walk in our destiny. So we, hey, let's talk about destiny. We, yeah, God, you are made for a purpose, but you need to know who you are. Until you know your identity, you cannot walk in your destiny. So let me share with you who you are, who God is says you are. And I wrote these as I am statements because I want you to receive this today, church. I want you walking out of here with a God-given identity. You're not who you think you are, who your parents said you were, who your teachers said. You are who God says you are. And this is who God says you are. Number one, I am chosen. I am chosen. Before John was ever born, God chose him. Before John ever got a chance to prove himself, God chose him. Okay, God didn't give him an assignment, and then, and then he kind of lived his life, messed up a little bit, and he got a lesser assignment. Okay, John, uh, you can be the forerunner, okay? You ain't going to be the guy. We're gonna, Jesus will take over from here, John. That's not what happened. He got his assignment. He was chosen before he was ever born by God. Psalm 139 talks about this. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. He's talking about the womb, the mind of God. When I was woven together in the depths of of the earth. When it comes to your, to your uh, God cho choosing you, you need to know that before you ever chose God, He chose you. That before you ever chose God, and that's important for you to understand because if you understand that salvation began in God, then you'll understand that God will carry it out to completion. God completes everything He starts. If God and it doesn't matter. It's, it doesn't, it's not determined on your performance. We often judge ourselves like on uh, like the outward things that, that we can do. And, and God's uh, destiny on our life is on our ability somehow. It has nothing to do with your ability at all. It's, it has nothing to do with you being good or not. It, 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 if, if God didn't choose us because our goodness, he's not counting on our goodness to keep us. Okay? It, he, he chose you. And do you know why God chose you? It's the same reason he chose John the Baptist. He chose you to bear his character. He chose you to be a light. He chose you that you might know him, that you would love him. He chose you because he is love, he is gracious, he is merciful, and he has a great plan for your life. You are chosen by God. And that's part of your idea. You need to know that. It's not about you. God did it before you were born. He decided it. You are chosen. Here's number two about your identity. You got to know. Number two, I am called. I am called. You have to know this because until you define your identity, you can't walk in your destiny. The next verse of Psalm 139 says it like this. Your eye, God, saw my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me, you already knew. You knew, you knew all the days. They're written in your book before one of them even came to be. God, you already know my story, and you chose me anyway, and you called me anyway. You need to know two things about your calling, probably, that, that are really important, okay? Uh, one, there is a general call that God, it's called a general, theologically, general call that God gives to all mankind. It's just called a general call. The way we say it here at Discovery Church, that all mankind is called by God to love God, love each other, and to change the world. That is, that is the call of God that's stretched out to every person in, in the world. That God has called us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love our neighbor as ourselves, and to make a difference. To change the world. That's, our, that's, that's your call. You're called. But there's also a specific 
call. There's a specific call that God has on your life. This is a unique assignment that God gives to you that as you are being led by the Spirit in fulfilling this call, Jesus gets glory. Jesus is glorified on the earth. And the great thing, the great thing about the specific call is if he calls you to it, he'll see you through it. It's his call. It's his assignment on your life. I love um, Ephesians chapter 4. In your notes, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I love this verse, but I want to kind of back it up and give you something that's not in your verse. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. You know, your Bibles didn't always have chapters and verses in it, and sometimes when you go from one chapter to the next, it loses context and meaning, and it breaks it up in our mind. But right before Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 is Ephesians chapter 3, and just so happens this is my life verse, my favorite verse, my life verse, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, it, it directly precedes what, what's in your notes and what I'm going to show you in Ephesians chapter 4. Check this out. It's important it's to see it in the context. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to not who you are, not how good you are, not how smart you are, not how, how gifted you are, no, nope, according to his power that is at work within us, to him. When, be the glory, not me, not my name, not my gifts, no, no, no. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And then he says something like, can I get a witness? Amen, somebody, come on. That's what that means right there. He's like, can I get a witness, all right? Amen. Are you in agreement? He says, look, in light of that, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, look, in light of the immeasurably more that God can do um, through his power at work within you, like in light of all that, he says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then, I love that thought, a prisoner of the Lord, captivated by the grace of God. I am his, I'm a prisoner of grace. Then I urge you, he says, to live a life Worthy of the calling you've received. In light of the immeasurable, immeasurably more, the, 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 the plan of God, the destiny of God that is so much bigger and greater and more than you can ever ask, than you can ever dream, than you can ever imagine. And, and according to his power that would be at work within you, live, Paul is saying, live worth, don't live like you don't have a call of and a claim of God on your life. Don't live like he hasn't gifted you with an assignment to fulfill. I urge you, he says, to live worthy of that call that God has placed on your life. And then he continues, because to each one of us, a grace has been given. And that word grace means charis. It means a grace gift. The gift is what it literally means. Each one of you has been given a grace gift as Christ apportioned it. This is why it said, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gives to his people. Paul is saying, look, I'm, man, I'm urging you guys to live worthy of this call that God has placed on your life. He has given you everything you need. He's given you gifts to fulfill them. Man, I urge you to not live like the rest of the world. Don't try to fit into the norms and the customs of culture. Dare to be different. Dare to shine for me. Dare to be a forerunner and a proclaimer of this great news that I've called you to be a herald of. Amen, somebody? You are called by God. You have a destiny on your life, and that kind of leads to number three, which is I am compelled. I love this word compelled because not only am I chosen, not only am I called by God, but there's, there's like a compelled, meaning I'm like, there's a force inside of me that's moving me. Like, I'm not trying to... Fix it, work it, do it. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. That's not following Jesus. It's not about the do's and don'ts. It's, it's man, I'm moved. Something is, is moving me toward the assignment, toward my destiny. It's like wind in my cells. I'm just going for a ride as the Spirit of God is compelling me forward. Luke chapter 1, verse 77. This, this whole monologue here is a prophetic word of, of Zechariah to his son, uh, John the Baptist, immediately when his mouth is open, um, he starts to declare, which a prophetic word, by the way, a lot of people think prophecy is declaring the future, and that's not what a prophecy is at all. That's not biblical prophecy. Prophecy is declaring the mind and the will of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That is what, that is what prophecy is, and here... He starts, Zechariah is prophesying, he's declaring the mind and the will of God 
over his son. Parents, you need to take note of this. You need to be prophesying over your children because there is greatness inside of them. There is, there is the Holy Spirit that is available to them that you need, you need to be declaring God's will and greatness inside. He says, hey, son, you, let me tell you, you will tell people how to find salvation through the forgiveness of of their sins. That's what's going to happen. You're going to be compelled towards this destiny, toward this purpose. And if you ever receive Jesus, you know, man, you, once you, you can't help but to share this good news. You just are hoping someone's going to ask you about the hope that you have or ask you about the smile on your face. It's like a fire shut up in your bones that you can't shut up if you wanted to. Amen, somebody? That's, that's what happens when you, when you receive. You, get, you are compelled to this destiny this life through the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a few verses that aren't in your notes about this, just what the Bible says about being compelled. The apostle Paul in Acts 20, 22 says, now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. I'm just like, he's, he's moving me there, not even knowing what's going to happen to me. I don't even know if it's safe or not, but I feel this force moving me toward this assignment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, when I preach the gospel, I can't even bo boast because it's not me. I have this compelling force moving me to declare the word of God, to preach. And woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. I'll fall dead. I will, I will scream if I don't declare this word out. And it's not even, it's not even me who's trying to do it anymore. It's just, it's just something in me moving me to accomplish my destiny, moving me toward my assignment, moving me toward to obey God, it's not like I have to. It's like, oh, man, I better, I better go to church. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, sh I should. I probably should. I should read my Bible. No, that's not. Like, there, like, like when you have this spirit inside of you, he compels you towards your destiny. Look what it says in Romans 13, verse 5. It says, you are compelled to obey. It's not like I got to now. Not, not just to avoid the punishment. Yeah, I guess I should go to church. I don't want to go to hell. So I guess, I guess I will serve. I mean, I would rather have, I want blessings, you know. I guess I'll give my tithe. I'll give my tithe because I don't, I don't want to curse, you know. No, you're, but because you, look at this, because you want to live with a clean conscience. He'll compel your want to. It's not I have to anymore. It's this, this Holy Spirit moving you to want to fulfill your assignment, fulfill your destiny. Amen, somebody? Amen. And before you... Start disqualifying yourself again. John chapter 10, verse 21. Jesus says to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so also I'm giving you the same assignment, the same assignment that John had, the same assignment I came, so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You need, you need this fullness of the Spirit to compel you to do what I've called you to do. But why me? Why? I'm nobody. I'm nobody. I don't, I'm not smart. I'm not gifted. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a this. Let me answer that question. I'm just answering your questions now. I'm going to wrap this up. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 27. It says, but God chose the foolish things of the world. He chose the Johns of the world, the outcasts, the one who didn't conform, the one who didn't care what other people think or what he was wearing or what he looked like. The one who didn't care what his name was. God knew it. God cared. John didn't. I'm just a voice in the wilderness. He chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world. That's why you're chosen. That's why he chose you. Not because you're great, but because God could be great in you. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Write it down this way. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. You are chosen. You are called by God and you are compelled by his spirit. Let me close with this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen people. That's who you are. You're chosen by God. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's special possession. Why? 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 Why did God choose us? 
Why, did God, why does God call us? What is God compelling us toward? The same thing, that the same reason he did for John the Baptist. So that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's why God called you. Because he's got a mission. He's got destiny in your life. Can, I just, can we just bow our heads and close our eyes all across?